All right, welcome back to our second video. So just a reminder, if you haven't watched the intro to chemistry one or you don't or you uh, don't feel like you remember a lot of chemistry, please go back and watch that. So if you're watching this one, I'm assuming that you've either watched the other one or that you're pretty comfortable with uh, topics from chemistry when you've taken them or taken that class because today is going to build on especially what we ended with last time with polar bonds and hydrogen bonding because those were important to set up with what we're talking about today which is the properties of water so why are we going to study water the very first thing that we do in the chemistry of life and it's because of this. All life needs water. Of the things which is required by life in any form that humans have discovered it so far, water is the least flexible. There's no form of life that we've found that doesn't in some way require water inside and outside of the cell. Most of the inside of any uh, cell is made up of water. That's why the earth is about 72% water, kind of like our bodies. So just a throwback to what we ended last time talking about. Water molecules are polar, which means they can form hydrogen bonds with each other. Remember, just to review, here is a hydrogen bond. There's dotted lines. It occurs between the slightly positive hydrogen atom in the water molecule of one water molecule and the slightly negative oxygen atom oxygen in another water molecule. All right, they create, the, they allow those molecules of water to be sticky, to stick together through those hydrogen bonds. And they're responsible, those hydrogen bonds are, for all of water's useful properties. So we're going to talk about a number of properties today. They all come back to being founded or grounded in water's hydrogen bonds which arise because it is a small polar molecule. So you can see from this picture how water molecules can be oriented to form multiple hydrogen bonds with multiple other water molecules. So we are going to look at these special properties of water today. And these are ones that you should be able to know what they are and be explain why they're useful or important for life. Water is cohesive and adhesive. We'll talk about this more, but cohesive means that water molecules can stick to each other. And adhesive means it can, they can stick to other substances. And that gives rise to water's high surface tension and the phenomenon known as capillary action. Water is a good solvent, which means many molecules dissolve in water, which is important when you think about the fact that your blood is mostly water and needs to carry around a lot of nutrients in your body. It is one of the few substances whose liquid form is more dense than its solid form, meaning that ice floats in liquid water. And we'll talk about why that's important. Water has a high specific heat, which means that it takes a lot of thermal energy to raise its temperature. It's a good storehouse heat sink, stores energy. And then it has a high heat of va vaporization. It heats and cools very slowly. So we're going to look at these in a little bit more detail next. But 
just to have the quick overview, these are some of the special and important properties of water. And all of these have properties arise because of water's ability to form hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonding that occurs between water molecules gives rise to cohesion. And like I said, cohesion is water sticking to other water. Water is sticky. Cohesion. When water sticks to other molecules of water. All right? And it gives rise to the surface tension. Surface tension is like this. I mean that uh, water strider standing on the water there is attraction between those surface molecules and that attraction, right, that force of attraction prevents very, very light things from falling through. Like some people might be able to float a paper clip on water. That has to do with water's surface tension. Now the hydrogen bonding between water molecules and other substances is called adhesion. Water sticks to something else. Right. This is when you see like the meniscus in a metal in a not metal a glass graduated cylinder. The water that sticks to the glass almost defies gravity. All right. That's why water kind of climbs up a paper towel or cloth. If you just put a corner of it into some water, um, after a while, water will have moved through the whole cloth. That is another example of adhesion, water sticking to other substances. So, I mean, this gives rise to one of the important things why cohesion and adhesion is important is how does water get to the top of a tree? And the, we'll talk more about this when we talk about uh, plants. But Part of it is that water is able to fight gravity because it is adhesive to the inside vessel elements of the tree. It's cohesive, so it sticks to each other. And then as it evaporates through the leaves, it is pulled up against gravity through the vessel elements in the trees via those cohesive and adhesive properties. So if water wasn't as cohesive or adhesive, we couldn't have tall trees or plants. Water is also a good solvent because it is polar. So polar substances dissolve polar things in them. All right? So polar water molecules can surround positive and negative ions like you see down here in this picture or proteins you saw down here in this picture. That's what it means when something dissolves. It means that it gets surrounded by water molecules that start to form weak hydrogen bonds with it. So Water is a solvent which dissolves solutes in them. Because water is a polar, sol uh, polar solvent, it can dissolve polar solutes in them. So like dissolves like. Polar substances like ions or proteins dissolve in polar solvents like water. And interestingly enough, a lot of the really important things that your body needs, your cells need, are polar. And so life wouldn't work if there, if water was not a non-polar solvent. So one of the new names that we give for something that dissolves or mixes in water is called hydrophilic, which comes from hydro, which means water, and philic, which means to like or to love. So water loving, hydrophilic substances are polar. 
things that are polar dissolve into polar substances. All right. Hydrophobic is the word that we use for substances that don't have an attraction to water, like oil. Because hydrophobic substances are nonpolar. They don't interact with the water. The water can't surround and dissolve them. So they're hydrophobic or water fearing. You could uh, remember that because of uh, it's related to the word hydrophobia, which is a fear of water. Hydrophobic are things that don't mix in water. Next is the interesting case of ice. Most or all, question mark, something I want you to think of is if you can find another substance. Most substances are more dense when they're solids than liquids, but not water. Water is one of the few exceptions where its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. And this means that water, solid water, ice floats on liquid water. And that loss of density from liquid to solid comes about because as the molecules of water in ice cool down and form ice, these hydrogen bonds that they form between each other kind of push them and space them out into a crystal lattice type structure which increases the space between atoms as opposed to when there was slightly higher energy in the liquid form. If water was more dense as a liquid than a solid, life would not be possible. Because that would mean that in the winter when water starts to freeze, it would freeze and at the top and sink to the bottom and smash all of the animal life that hibernates at the bottom of the lake. But because ice floats, a lake freezes from top downward and not from bottom upward. And that has given the ability of life to survive the winters in lakes and ponds and rivers and things. Oceans and lakes don't freeze solid. If ice sank, like I said, eventually all ponds, lakes, and even the ocean would freeze solid. In summer, only up a few inches would ever thaw out. Since ice floats, surface ice insulates the water below it, giving life the ability to survive in the winter. And it, like we will talk more about in ecology at the end of the year, it also leads to the seasonal turnover of lakes, those cyclings of nutrients, when you might smell in the spring that like ponds or lakes really, really smell bad because those nutrients are being pulled up to the top. <clears throat> water also has a high specific heat, which means that H2O water resists a change in temperature. You, add, can, you can add a lot of heat to water without changing its temperature. It takes a lot to heat it up, and it takes a lot to cool it down. That's why water is a good heat sink or temperature moderator on Earth. All right. If it weren't for the vast amounts of water on the Earth's surface, we would see much more severe effects of global warming at this point than we do. All right. Because the ocean temperatures might only change a fraction of a degree when a large amount of heat is added to the atmosphere. If, there, if it was just all dry land, that atmospheric temperature would heat up considerably with that same amount of heat energy put in because air has a much lower specific heat. So specific heat is very important in maintaining climate. It's the reason, for example, that uh, we have... <clears throat> Areas near large bodies of water like Lake Michigan can feel cooler or on the coasts because of that ability to trap energy. It's also why we get like sea breezes in the morning at night. If you've ever been to the beach, it is the turnover of heat in the morning at night because of water's high specific heat. Um, let's see.
And then we have water, uh, its ability to be uh, to cool, evaporative cooling. Organisms rely on uh, heat, a vaporization, to remove heat from their body. So uh, we're going to go back to this picture here. Um, if this is a graph that shows a change in temperature of water versus the amount of energy that you're adding to water, going from a liquid to a gas, water can absorb a ton of heat before it will change into a gas and evaporate. And that's very important, right? This amount of energy here is the heat of vaporization. And that's important because it's how your body can cool itself from sweat. It can absorb a large amount of heat from your body before it evaporates into water vapor. And removing all that heat from your body cools it down. The last thing we're going to talk about is water. Yep. Last thing we're talk about is water and pH. Right? Water ionizes, which means that it can split apart into a positive hydrogen part and a negative OH part. All right. Positive part and negative part. Okay. Why that's important is that if, if we have a solution in which we have more H pluses, hydrogen ions, than OH negatives, which we call hydroxide ions, we say that that solution is acidic and that an acid... donates or gives up hydrogen ions to a solution. So something that's very acidic will donate a lot of hydrogen ions to a solution. On the other hand, if we have a solution that has less hydrogen ions than hydroxide ions, it is basic. So we say that a base removes or accepts hydrogen ions. Something that's more basic will more readily remove hydrogen ions. And that is where we get the pH scale. The pH scale, which measures how acidic or basic a solution is. So pH is actually a short form of power of hydrogen. So the pH scale is a numerical scale which rates different substances on their ability to take hydrogen ions or accept hydrogen ions. So something that is a low number is very acidic. It will not take any hydrogen ions at all. In fact, it's very good at donating them. But something that is a high number, 14, will very readily take hydrogen ions. So in the pH scale, something that is basic will be up here, the 14 end. Something that is acidic will be down here close to the 1 end. And then we'll have water. which is right in the middle. And what that means is water is just as likely to donate a hydrogen ion into solution as it is to accept one or remove one. So it is right in the middle. It can ionize both ways. Here is a picture of um, the pH scale. So some common uh, examples of Things that are very low pH, very acidic, will donate hydrogen ions very readily. Things that are very basic will readily accept hydrogen ions.
right? And lastly is water is a good buffer. So the pH of most cells must be kept relatively close to seven, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, because as we'll learn about proteins, pH affects the shape and the function of molecules. Your body controls the pH, maintains that small window by using things that are called buffers. And buffers are substances that can um, absorb or donate hydrogen ions to maintain a narrow range of pH. So these things will donate hydrogen ions when um, the pH starts to rise and absorb hydrogen ions when the pH starts to fall. And water is a good buffer, but your body has many more important ones that we'll talk about later when we get to cellular processes. But that's it about water. Water is the first th topic we're going to look at. And um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. But we will be going over this more in our synchronous session.